Okay. Um, thank you. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I'm a principal scientist at Charles River Analytics. We are a company of about 160 people, and we work um, on research projects primarily for the Department of Defense. And I've actually been working on probabilistic programming for about 20 years. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the culmination of a lot of years of research. Is it this one? There we go. OK, so um, I'm first going to talk to you about what exactly is probabilistic programming and why might you be interested in it. Then I'm going to talk about the system that we've been developing called Figaro. I'm going to give you a few examples and applications. And then I'm going to talk to you about the future of the field and where we're going. So in a nutshell, what we're trying to do with probabilistic programming is we want to be able to predict future events given some situation that we're in. We want to infer past causes of current observations. And we, in general, want to be able to learn from experience to make better predictions. And we want to do this with much less effort and expertise required than previously. Now, all these things, predicting the future, inferring the past, and learning from experience, are things that you can do with probabilistic reasoning. Not programming, reasoning. And this slide shows um, probabilistic reasoning in a nutshell. You have a probabilistic model that contains general knowledge about a situation that you're interested in. And then you have evidence, which is specific knowledge about that situation. And you have some queries, which are things that you don't know that you want to infer from your evidence. Your probabilistic reasoning system provides an inference algorithm that lets you answer these queries using the rules of probability um, to get what you want to know. So let me give you an example. First of all, predicting the future. Suppose you're a manager of a soccer team, and you want to know what's going to happen on a certain corner kick in the game of soccer. Now, you have a model of how corner kicks work in general, and you also have evidence about a particular corner kick. The center forward is tall, the goalie is inexperienced, it's a strong wind, and your query is whether a goal will be scored. So you run your inference algorithm on your model, and it gives you an answer. The answer is framed in terms of probabilities. Now, if you fast forward 20 seconds and you see a goal was scored, you can ask, why was the goal scored? Uh, maybe the goalie was no good. So you have a query, how good is the goalie? And in fact, the answer is, well, the goalie was poor with probability 50%, so you found a possible cause of what actually happened. Now, let's fast forward another 20 minutes. There's another corner kick. Um, again, a tall center forward, inexperienced goalie. You know a goal was scored last time, but this time the wind is weak. And now you ask the query again, will a goal be scored? And you can use your previous experience to help you answer this query better this time. And now you can generalize that and say, what it happens if you have a lot of past experience? What if you have a whole season's worth of corner kicks to learn from? You can actually take your original corner kick model and learn and improve it to predict better in the next season. So in a nutshell, these are all great things that probabilistic reasoning can do for you and why probabilistic machine learning has been important and popular. But probabilistic reasoning is really hard because to make this work, you need to implement the representation. You need to implement the inference algorithms. You need to implement the learning algorithm. You need to be able to interact with data. You need to be able to integrate with an application. If you want a canned kind of model like a Bayesian network, you can do this. But if you want to build probabilistic reasoning applications in generality for complex problems, it's very hard. So the goal of probabilistic programming is to drastically reduce the amount of work required to build probabilistic reasoning applications. And there are two main things that probabilistic programming provides that help it to achieve this goal. First of all, it provides an expressive programming language representation for representing models. We know programming languages are very powerful. We can use that power for building probabilistic models. And second, it provides general purpose inference and learning algorithms that apply automatically to models written in the language, which means all you have to do in principle is represent your model in code and you get the application, the inference and learning algorithms for free. 
Now, just one, a couple of words, because people often ask, so how does probabilistic programming compare to deep learning? What does probabilistic programming give you that deep learning doesn't? So there are a few things. First of all, in a probabilistic reasoning application, it's possible to incorporate rich domain knowledge. So you might have no data about soccer, but you have a, no a lot of knowledge about how soccer games work that you can encode in your corner kick model, and you can get it to work well even without data. And, on, and at the same time, probabilistic reasoning also scales, so as you incorporate new data, you, imp you improve your model. So it works when you have a little data or a lot of data. Um, another feature of probabilistic programs is that they're explainable and understandable. Essentially, a probabilistic program is a model of how a situation in the world is generated. It tells a story about how the data is generated, and you can read that story and understand that story. And another thing that actually distinguishes probabilistic programming from previous probabilistic reasoning uh, methods is that it can predict outputs that belong to complex data types where the actual size of this data type can vary. So you can, for example, predict a social network with a probabilistic program. And I'm actually going to give you an example where we predicted such a complex data type in a, in a couple of minutes. Now, these are not actually um, one or the other methods. Actually, some of the most interesting work in machine learning is on integrating deep learning and probabilistic programming and other methods. And actually, in the next version of Figaro, there will be programming patterns for incorporating models that are trained using different machine learning paradigms, such as deep learning. So now I'm going to talk about the language that we've been developing um, since 2009 called Figaro. And the goal of Figaro, as I said, I've been working in probabilistic programming for a long time. And I came to Figaro thinking, I want a language that's really going to be practical, easy to use, and you can create real applications with it. So it has to be easy to interact with data. It has to be easy to integrate with applications. It should provide a general and expressive representation to capture a wide variety of common programming patterns. Particular patterns that we wanted to capture is functional programming, which has been important in the history of probabilistic programming. Also, object-oriented models are very important in probabilistic reasoning. We want to be able to express those. There are undirected models like Markov logic. We wanted to be able to capture those. So we wanted Figaro to be a very general language. And also, we didn't want Figaro just to offer one or two inference algorithms, but rather provide a whole variety of inference algorithms that you can mix and match on any given application. The main design feature of Figaro is that it's a Scala library. Essentially, Figaro is a set of data structures in Scala that represent probabilistic programs. So you write a Scala program that constructs a Figaro model, that model is the probabilistic model. And then inference algorithms implemented in Scala operate on those models. Now, there are actually many advantages that we found of embedding Figaro in Scala rather than having a separate language for probabilistic programming, which is what previous languages were. First of all, we benefit from all of Scala's capabilities uh, to interact with data, and we can easily integrate with any application that compiles to the Java virtual machine. So in particular, all the different Java applications out there can integrate with um, Figaro. Um, an interesting thing that we're able to do, because we're in Scala, we can actually embed general purpose Scala code within our Figaro models. And we've used that, for example, to incorporate physics models inside a Figaro model. So the physics model might be solving some differential equations, and that can be incorporated in the Figaro model as arbitrary code. Another thing we can do is construct models programmatically. So we actually find that Figaro is a very good compilation target for different languages because we can construct the models programmatically just however we want. As I said, we wanted Figaro to be object-oriented and functional, while well, Scala is both object-oriented and functional, so that's great. And we could also specify undirected models using constraints, which are just Scala functions. 
And finally, Scala has a very nice uh, traits capability that lets us easily build an extensible library of inference algorithms. However, I have to be honest, nothing comes for free, and there are disadvantages of Scala embedding. One disadvantage is that because we can embed arbitrary Scala code in a Figaro model, it's harder to reason about Figaro at the source code level and do certain program transformations that might lead to better inference in certain situations. Also, I will readily admit that representing Figaro models in Scala is not quite as elegant a syntax as a standalone special purpose probabilistic programming language. And also, there is a steep learning curve to learning Figaro because, especially if you don't know Scala, you have to learn both Scala and Figaro. But we have found that this is not a big impediment, that beginners can easily learn to write Figaro models quickly. And our experience is we've been able to build a lot of applications with Figaro, and the power and practicality more than make up for these uh, disadvantages. So that's, I'm not going to show you the Figaro language in this, in this short talk. I'm just going to give you a few examples, and you will see one slide with Figaro code. So this first example um, was a, an application where we built hydrological terrain models for army logistics. So the problem we were given with was to figure out which locations in a region would be suitable for placement of fuel tanks or fuel pipelines or water tanks? And we considered things like rainfall and water runoff and terrain conditions. And the nice thing about this application is that Figaro novices who had never worked with Figaro before were able to quickly build up a machine learning application, integrate it with a geographic display, and this display um, shows over a region, the red shows um, uh, locations that were found to be inappropriate for these fuel tanks, and the green shows locations that were found to be appropriate. A more complex application that we developed, this is for the DARPA Cyber Genome Program, is to determine the lineage of a malware family. So when um, a malware author writes a piece of malware, they don't write the code entirely from scratch each time. They use code that they've written before or that they find somewhere else. And therefore, malware has a lineage. A piece of malware has other malware that it's descended from. And so we built an application that had um, several stages. The first stage is it computed a variety of features of each malware sample. Then it clustered the malware into families, and then for each family of malware, it determined the lineage of the malware. Now, we started out with a non-probabilistic approach to computing the malware lineage, but then we thought, let's see if we can build a probabilistic model to determine the lineage of malware from things like the timestamps of the malware. There's a compiler timestamp, well, that might be obfuscated, so you can't quite trust it. There's also the time that the malware was first seen in the wild. And then you've got all the features of the different malware, and we created a probabilistic model of the timestamps and of the mutation, addition of features, deletion of features, change of features. And using this probabilistic model, we were able to recover the lineage of the malware. And what this graph shows you is that our probabilistic solution, which is the dark blue, scored much higher across a range of linear, lineage metrics than the pr previous solution, which is the green. So this is something that we really wouldn't have been able to do without Figaro. The third example um, is an, also from a DARPA program. This is the Probabilistic Programming for Advancing Machine Learning program. So this is a program that a lot of the Figaro development is actually funded by. With probabilistic programming, we actually came up with a new algorithm that we wouldn't even have thought of without probabilistic programming, and this algorithm actually fits in one slide of Figaro. So the problem is tracklet merging, which is part of target tracking. In target tracking, you're given uh, some sensor information, maybe these are radar blips, and you want to identify trajectories of objects, so trajectories of aircraft that are producing those radar blips. And one of the approaches to target tracking is a two-step approach. The first step is to create these little pieces of tracks called tracklets. And the second step is to stitch up these little tracklets together into complete tracks. 
And this is the tracklet merging problem. So in this problem, we're given a set of tracklets, and we have to identify which tracklets follow which other tracklets, and which tracklets precede which other tracklets. So our solution is actually really simple. For each tracklet, um, Let me just do it this way. For each tracklet, we have a set of successor tracklets. So the top left tracklet, you see all those green arrows, those are all different possible successors of that tracklet that we've identified giving compatibility to the original tracklet. And each one has a probability. And then for each tracklet, we also have a set of candidate predecessor tracklets. These are shown by the orange arrows. Again, each with a given probability. So the algorithm is just, for each tracklet, choose its successor tracklet and choose its pre predecessor tracklet. Now, this doesn't make any sense until you introduce a constraint that says that the predecessor of your successor has to be equal to the original tracklet. So if you choose your tracklets according to the constraint, you've got a legal assignment of tracklets to tracks. And so here's the Figaro model for representing uh, this algorithm. We have a tracklet class. It takes a list of successor candidates. These are the two candidates. Each one has a probability and a successor tracklet. And it takes a list of predecessor candidates, the from candidates, again, a probability and a predecessor tracklet. We select the next tracklet from the successor candidates and the previous tracklet from the predecessor candidates, and the remainder of the code is just enforcing the constraint that the predecessor of the successor has to be equal. So there's a couple of lines where I declare this next previous, and that is Figaro code for identifying the predecessor of the successor. Now remember, the successor is a random variable, so I'm actually chaining together two random variables, and that's a fundamental operation in Figaro. And then the last line observes that the source tracklet is the same as the predecessor of the successor, and that's it. So now in the time remaining, I want to talk about where we're going with probabilistic programming. So the current state of the art, I think that to a large extent, we've succeeded in the goal I stated at the beginning of the talk, which is to significantly reduce the effort required to build complex probabilistic reasoning applications. But we're not all the way to the goal yet. And the problem is that it still requires quite a lot of machine learning expertise to make these applications work. First of all, you have to know how to write your models in a way that will make sense. And second of all, you have to be able to choose your inference algorithms and configure them appropriately. And that requires some expertise. So our goal is to develop a probabilistic programming framework that domain experts with little or no machine learning knowledge can use. And by domain expert, I mean someone like an intelligence analyst or a marketing person, people with a political science degree or a business degree. They're not mathematicians. They're not engineers. They're not programmers, and I want them to be able to build probabilistic programming systems. So we've got three research tracks towards this goal. The first one is we are developing a structured English-like language for describing the domain. Um, second one is we can't expect a domain expert to be able to specify all the details of a probabilistic model that are needed to define a program. So we have to have a way for filling in some of those gaps automatically. And then the third step is, once you've created your model, we want you to be able to push a button and have inference run automatically and get a good inference algorithm most of the time. So I'm going to talk about our work towards a third goal. So automated inference, how do we do that? Well, our strategy is step one, we decompose an inference problem into many subproblems, and we do this using the structure of the program. Step two is we optimize the choice of an appropriate solver for each subproblem. We have a variety of algorithms available to us for, for each subproblem. And step three, um, we then combine the subproblem solutions into a solution of the whole problem. 
And our framework for doing this is what we call structured factored inference. The reason it's factored is because our subproblems are represented as factor graphs, which are a common data structure used in graphical models. And we can use any algorithm in the family of algorithms called factored algorithms to solve these subproblems. Examples you might have heard of are variable elimination, belief propagation, Gibbs sampling, and there are others. And these are the algorithms that tend to win graphical model inference competitions. So these are generally very good algorithms. And we intelligently choose between the available algorithms on each subproblem. So I'm not going to show you the program. This is a compiled graphical model of a Figaro program. And the first step is to decompose it into subproblems. And I've got four subproblems, and then the top level problem is shown in yellow. And this is an automatic decomposition. We then solve each of those subproblems. And when you solve a subproblem, you get a factor that can be put into the factor graph of the higher level problem. And also, one of the nice things we get out of this approach is reuse of computation. So the two purple subproblems are actually identical. So we only have to solve it once. And similarly, for the two orange subproblems. And then we optimize each subproblem in individually. And this um, chart is one of many results we have that shows the power of this optimizing each subproblem. So we compared, in this case, three algorithms. Variable elimination is an exact inference algorithm. It gives you the perfect answer, but it can be very slow, especially when the model gets large. Belief propagation is an approximate algorithm. And we also used an algorithm that intelligently chooses between variable elimination and belief propagation based on the properties of the subproblem. And as the problem got larger, variable elimination just ran out of memory. It just couldn't run on these problems. And what you see, the orange, which is very small, the right bar in each set of four bars, is the best variable elimination belief propagation hybrid. That's the light orange. Whereas this tall orange, the second bar from the left, is the belief propagation, the best belief propagation we got. So we can see that the hybrid algorithm was orders of magnitude more accurate than the original algorithm, uh, belief propagation algorithm, and the variable elimination algorithm wouldn't run at all. So what we have, have we achieved? Not only does the user not have to decide, should I use variable elimination or belief propagation or any of the other algorithms? But we've actually come up with a much better algorithm than either of the original algorithms. So to conclude, what do I want you to get out of this talk? First of all, probabilistic reasoning is a powerful framework for machine learning. It helps you predict the future, infer past causes of your current situation, and learn from experience. Probabilistic programming makes this much easier. Figaro is a mature and practical probabilistic programming situation system with many applications. And we're striving to make probabilistic programming even easier. I would like to acknowledge the sponsors of this research, DARPA and the Air Force. And of course, the standard caveats apply. And finally, um, as I do have a book. Figaro is open source. We welcome contributions. I welcome questions. And at the bottom of this slide, you can also see there's a discount code for this book, 39% off at the Manning website, or for any other Manning books that you're interested in. Thank you very much. And I will be signing books later.